a gentleman walked into the house who is a board certified card carrying union genius. I evoked a Lakota ceremony, the Hunka Yapi, H U N K A Y A P Y, which interestingly enough, Blood King unequivocally could not participate in. I have adopted him as my son and will look after his essence and well-being to the day I expire, and he myself. I welcome Michael Rose to be the next speaker. Greetings. All right, I'm going to read a few poems. Perhaps uh, some will be entertaining, more enlightening, depending. This is called Can Anyone Seize This Sun? It's uh, a little bit about, it's kind of about a person who is coming to terms with the fact that anyone can learn to write. Can anyone seize this sun? Legs crossed and cool. A bitter mouth, iron tossed flange. The symbolic beginning of a poem, the posture of the posturing poet. This basement apartment is like a purple and gold pansy, not of summer, but of rainy bristol. Wintry Wilkes bar, brown and glistening autumn Appalachia. For months, I have not pressed a playful or musing word of poetry into a page. My heart, alas, stirring cold stone soup, rummaging a woodland, a mist, a woodpile. Yes, I say it's felt much like a mist. A mist not often very wide. A mist also often wider than this world and its hollow eyes and its sacred woods and its marvelous dirt, its June bugs, its bumblebees, and its yellow light, and its green rain. Alas, anyone can seize this pine heart, absolutely anybody. The pine heart often thinks, the language bending and whispering like some circuitous breeze or gnarled trees, not Indeed, my mind has been a handful of branches, shaken and taken, and shooken and shook by a seasonal shift. The pine speaks. If focus is all the magic these poems really need, why write? Why spill the sack of time for silly seeds? For anyone can write down the Zen bones, or the visceral groan, the tungsten or the feathery throat. Anyone can clamber to the light there and lift the endless torch and sound the endless bong. Anyone can hold the evening, can cup it in their hands, blow into it, light it to fire, smoke it to life. Let it fly and swim and drift and be faint and lift and become light like soft magic, flutter like paper and bird's wings, and let it soar and drop and perhaps climb and climb and climb. This mountain, my body, is crossed and cool. It is bitter mouth and stone blue. It is light and burning orange and sun Magma lifting, lifting. Heart's sappy odor prompts me, I think. I truly do not know if anyone can seize this kind of sun. For long, I have, I have myself not sat in a binding night. I have not unlit the pace of the buzzing, heaving, bereaving, hauling heft. Oranges 
glaring wheat and glow, red ripe raving birch bark. For my part, I do care to not jostle my tones and raise the earth to a word. A piece of me does not want for anyone to have the sun, to hold it, to kindle it, and let it fly. Oh, but if it should be so, oh, but if it should be so, thinks I, that anyone can seize the hum. Even a tiny globule of dust can learn to write. And what craze, and what smallness, do you or I then derive in our pens or our brogue? What granular size do the great things within ourselves possess, O Kakura? What tea have I forgot to drink tonight? What other punch has gone electric and sent me to eternity like a dull-witted fool? What Zen whisk have I forgotten from the table's top? What holy leaf have I slept from the walkway? I. Let it be so that the world is thus and beautiful. And let the world, if it might, and I, smile with the humility of what is right at last. And let the earth, all of it, know that Smith's name. And let her or his heart soar high and sing and dawdle and ring. And let her or his mind froth and row and throng and meddle by the root of the shore-born tree like an ocean thrown foam. Let this mind perch and see the sacredest wood that is just this flower, bone, and trove. If it should be that, that anyone can seize the sun, I let it finally have come. Let this mind be a flower, white and whirling petal, sweet and wet, deep black pavement after rainfall, withering in time and living in this magnetic sun. So that is that poem. Thank you, sir. Can anyone see the sun? I just wrote a poem about uh, drinking uh, tea, drinking uh, shincha, which is a type of Japanese tea. It's very good. It's the layman's tea, but it's very good tea. So, sencha. When wine burbles, the bowels and fields drink yet again. They, after all, had built the wine. The wine is their meat. I picture now the hands of the leaf rollers and pickers. I see their faces, sometimes consternated, focused, other times joyous and sure, perhaps unhappy and wanting more, missing mother, regretting what they said to father. The light beats down and brings the camellia to life. She, a princess, delicately lifts her hands or shoulder or foot while the wind passes. She reads. She is beautiful, just like a real princess. She is all purple in hue, like my dazzling wife. She eats curry and laughs. Not a drop tips from its plate, and her hands float, waft, and fly, like a Taoist mist that they never perch. This is the camellia, young and passionate. I am without genmai, that means rice. I am without genmai in my cup today. But I still feel the rice fields, can smell its stealthy breezes, flying near and far like so many eagles around a nest. I love the sights of the fields and the adventures of the stalks, the heroes known and the tragedies sown, the spirits come and gone. So much history, 
cast in all its lights, yellow and blue and red and green, so much time, so many people, so many, many people. This is what my cup brings on any given day, a vast and particulate history. Can you picture the eyes of our princess as she watches, those other princesses of the fields, the lay folk working each day to bring the harvest into teacups? I am no princess, thinks Camellia. We all are such in our beautiful humanity. I picture the mesh bowl, shaking small debris away, the room drying all the leaves, the many fingers lightly rolling the leaves between their hands to break the leaf, but not completely. Only just enough. Even the factory in, is delicate in its own way, with its conveyor belts and steam systems, and its hulling mechanisms churning in the fields. Even there, and I and a hand must breathe the plant, and nitrogen must lift the heads of stalks just right. I could go on and on. I have barely spoken of the moon and her eyes and gaze at night, her gentle croon, the words of comfort she lets down in golden curl to the soil and plant, the warm white hands unfurled. Ah, yes, the tea. It sings of my mother, sitting beside me, just wishing to talk further wanting for a son to hear the orchestras of the heart a moment longer. And she would gently scratch my back and sing of Killarney, then my mother, a moon herself. Divorce and I miss my children are tight on the lips of Mother Moon. Even so, there is a love of the role between child and mother irrespective of context and overflowing with contents. For we are mother and son in every moment. Nature has written this and our life energies build this. Similarly, there is a, the bond between moon and field and insect and wind and temperature and leaf and worker and brew and taste and finally poem. This tea is such an overdue delight, even in its jazzy blues. Its luminescent memory spills from the lake of the water. I am glad for every moment. I am grateful for every word, and feeling stirred while I lay upon the bed with its sky blue sheet, wrinkly like an ocean stew. Upon the surface, I, a bobbing rowboat, muse. Uh, there is a there is a question in ancient philosophy, a Socratic question, meaning posed by Socrates. If you're unaware, most of us probably are aware, and that is this question of can virtue be taught. So I wrote a poem called "Can Virtue Be Taught." Feet crossed. Hand cool and blue. Let me show you the light inside the orange, the beautiful storms of its planetary world, a ripe and moonless Jupiter. Consider this tree. Barks crawl upward, spill like the edges of waves, impacted like brown cliffs. I can feel its breathing even from my couch. It speaks to the crickets, the crickets speaking in turn to the wind. How can I give this to you, this truth? Does it not seem to you like purple dust and mystic fantasy? So too is virtue. It is lived and that is all. We travel in this universe alone, even though the sun visits and blesses all.
What color is passion? Purple, like a temple veil, a plume of ink exploding in a bucket of water, volcanic ash rising, searing, taking, obsidian forming, slow and sleek, like street stream rolling, drops upon the stone walls of the city, with its lights beating like birds' wings, dancing with Martha Graham, flickering on the surface of the orb, in yellow, in purple, in curves. What colors passion? Well, it grows and grows, like the lines in this poem. Supernatural, it rises and falls. It calls to the winding wind, creates enjambments on the senses, lifts the light of the mind like curling waves, like tides below the glow of the moon. It twists and turns like a corkscrew. The diaphragm prays. The lungs inflame and deflate the mind with spirit drinks the tightening flutter, is seized by breathing wine. Lay down here upon the bed, stretch the limbs out, starfish your bones. Your mind needs to swim in the ocean plight. Grow, grow, grow. Passion leads us, eyes upon a destiny, time upon a scale. You cannot escape the elliptic hold, the gold arch, the inner fingers pizzicato of a heart's cord. Eyes rest from the rise of focus, the rule of night, the death of old self or all self. For a shout has come, it boils and, and it steeps, it starts red and flips over like a long glass pane and becomes indigo sleep. I, I slip into dreams and increase, sip upon a peppermint rim, drift in a tumult of dream, a warm ceramic of milk waits for me. At last, a prince, a possible king, a glow of ink or black font string. But for all, the purple here rings, the ash clouds, the sun above, the stone calms gray water's skin, water dances and water shines. Red wine burbling, starfish limbs reflecting white, clear mind expanding outward into night, strained, relaxed, Red and purple spill out from the air in the timeless and colorful climb. Mm -hmm. So I suppose purple is the color of fashion. Of fashion. Um, there's a poem by, uh, I think his name is pronounced Brendan uh, Brihan, maybe Brahan, an Irish fellow, a uh, writer from, I believe, I want to say, the 40s, I'm not certain. But he has a poem um, that goes this way, and what I did is I, it's called Loneliness, and I uh, sort of copied some of its form and changed it slightly. And I wrote about not loneliness, but anxiousness. So Brendan, Brihan's poem. Loneliness. The blackberries taste after rainfall on the hilltop. In the silence of the prison, the train's cold whistle, the whispering of laughing lovers to the lonely. Brendan Brihan. Anxiousness. The hiss of the stream in the quiet, near the rock bed. In the doorway of the bedroom, the wife's blue exit. 
the crunching of powdered popcorn to the greedy. So, those are some poems I wrote as of late. Here's an older poem that might uh, raise one's blood pressure, or <laughs> in a, not in a severe way, just in a healthy way, maybe. This is called What is Ailing You? Um, it's meant to kind of be a little comedic, so here it goes. What is ailing you? What ails me today? I feel a pang in my belly. Is that gluten intolerance? Nay, it must be a dallying celiacs, a kind too slippery for the clinicians to find. Or an infection in my ileum, a chronic thrum of chronic and yet so quiet, appendicitis. Or perhaps it's just my nerves because sometimes your nerves can cause these things, don't you know? Nay, what would entangle this lowland dullness in my head, this Saharan dryness on my lips, this low white crescent moon upon my fingernails, this teetering fog between parietal and temporal lobes, this agitation of my legs? I tell you, I can't think a good, clear thought, darn it. What perhaps is the cause? Oh, perhaps it's just my nerves. But no, the thyroid swells like a pumpkin in springy humidity, and the sodium monofluorophosphate in my gums is no better than its several ugly cousins, sodium fluoride, stannous fluoride, and acidulated phosphate fluoride. My temperature is subdeathly rising. You do know the endocrine system leans against these chemicals like a two-cash arm that leans against the air near a sturdy wall, right? So. Who can stand all this? This quaking in their knees, this sea of poisons in the soil. The DDT is not here anymore, but who thinks the rest are any better? The tomatoes drink the poison, the human drinks the tomato, but worst of all, the rain drinks the pesticide and sprinkles other places like a greater the size of the sky and malignant as the soil. And the earth is just like my body coughing and coughing into the wall near the hole, or the hole near the wall, or the hole in the wall. What is the difference? I cough, he coughs, we cough. I chortle, what is the difference? My hypothalamus rings from the toothpaste, I tell you. I tell you, I am not mad. The hypothalamus then dings my pineal, my pineal tugs my thyroid, and it's so inconsistent, no doctor can tell. But my temperature is rising, my brain is on fire. What to do with the pang in my belly? Tums? No, I'm sure it's celiacs. But no doctor can tell, because the roads are all tangled up like some gangly ball of yarn, and the cat's been out to play near the farmlands, and the dogs have been put out on account of a corn-based dog food cancer, and the medical professionals have been put out on account of circumstances. And now it's all so depressing. If I can't, quick. Find those tums, or at least a fluoride-free toothpaste. Oh, but then what about the water? Oh, perhaps it's just my nerves. <laughs> Sounds like old age. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that goes. And the audience may have thought I was all boring, but once in a while, spice it up. All right. Let's read the following. I'll read a short poem and then I'll read a, I'll read two short poems and then I'll torture you with a sort of longer one. This is called Memory. The root is memory. The soil, earth. We are like the flames of the hearth. Memories upon the charcoal ivory. Ghosts walking awake past the turning soil like the fingers of a rake. Ghosts walking past, awake upon the turning soil like the chortles of a lake. This is called the child of the leaves. The leaves shake like a thousand snow globes in the hands of chiming children. 
Here an eagle perches on a branch and drinks the lake through his shrill nostrils, with a rising beak focused upon a world beyond my own. The gravity that bends the stars bends the orbit of my experience like a beam of light. The time known to the eagle is a beautiful rhythm that ticks just like a clock on Pluto. Ah, the child of the leaves feels not the diaspora of the heart. Instead, the child sings like the metal tubes which chant outside the door, like a candle speaking outward to the wind. I wonder at the light of the child and at the holy breath of the yellow nose. Um, that was a little bit about uh, my small brother. I don't remember all the motivations, but he was partly in inspiring at the time. <laughs> partly inspiring, yeah. So you got to give the eagle credit. Um, this poem is called What Can We Become? On the eagle, actually. I, used, I was writing, I had the fortune of writing up above a lake for uh, well, a few, several years. Um, and there, this beautiful lake had tons of eagles which would fly over the lake, and I very much so enjoyed watching them. This poem, um, this poem is called What Can We Become? The weather padded the backs of the trees like it were giant hands and the trees giant dogs. Across the spotted marble island, thinking of tea, a horn rang and encouraged in me many things. With a pang of guilt, sighs of the roaring sun, I began to sleep. I dreamed myself up and saw burly pirates and treasures sunk down into deep pits in the oceans, down into narrow holes of the earth. I dreamed myself a saint, cradling infants and helping weary mothers to eat and nurse. The saint inside me felt himself real. A philosopher boomed on the scene. I was him, seeking truth, knowing what is enlightenment dividing the world and omniscient. I dreamed myself well-known. Many books had I written. Many souls had I impressed. I dreamed the books, too, and their titles. I wrote on Nietzsche, on metaphysics and epistemology. I chronicled my towering knowledge and knew myself bathed in the light of accomplishment and famous for good reason. I dreamed I was not there, a cloud. I sung in the sky and met angelic mists which grabbed my cloudy hands and brushed my cloudy body, and I was happy. I dreamt I was a butterfly and that I was not sure if I were asleep or not, were truly dreaming. I dreamt I were like Zhuangzi and finally myself. I breathed in the reality of where I was. I was not a poet. I gandered not upon the trees and upon the weather. In fact, I gandered not an hour earlier upon the shower head and the ceiling. I washed my hair in a yellow light and laid down upon the plastic. I inhaled steams and feared I'd soon obtain a headache. I wished then that I were not who I was and that I might be somebody else. I wish that truth might come to me unfairly. I wish that time were not me, and that I were not time, and truth were not truth, and light were not light. Really. I wish I'd have the world and all its water in a satchel. I wish I'd have the world unfairly, and be a count and live lives I felt I deserved and be a man of some specific kind. I sunk low. I sipped billows of steams. I dreamt I was myself, and my resume was spread out before me. 
I saw in it the eyes of a poet, a philosopher, a teacher, a theist, a musician, a technician, an author, a husband, and most importantly, a scoundrel. I saw myself a scoundrel. I saw myself a right. For I am no scoundrel, or poet, or philosopher, or teacher truly. No theist, or musician, or technician, or author, or husband. I am no fool either, because no man has ever been a fool, really, nor could he be. I dreamt a beaming truth, bathed in spring mist, and nestled beside me in your empty shampoo containers. We cannot become what we abstract, but we can abstract what we already have become. I dreamt I was happy. And I believed it for a moment, and then it passed into the eternity of the now, and it knew me not a moment longer. Let's see. Here's a, here, here's a short poem. For a, it's called Before Starting Work. Apparently I wrote it before work, I guess. Uh, or it could be like that poem, very, uh, very hypothetical. Before starting work, sneakers cross, spirit high like a mountain tempest, deeply into black water. Night steps upon trees, bent, sleeping in earthly cafe. Stalks of clavicle, like stooping blade of grass, remain erect. Low light hobbling on a timber plain. Yellow, astral smoke in heavenly Jupiter. There falling a single water droplet. This poem is called Loki. Loki is the name of the big god of mischief. And also, my dog, who is a very handsome fellow, a Shetsky. Today I saw the god of mischief hanging Indra's net between the trees. My friend, that wonderful wolf who drifts in and out of my world like a rising and setting moon these days. As he sniffs the borders of the grass, he shimmers like a fish's wiggly tail near a boat in the shallows of a sun-beaten body of water, reflects an elfish-like glow in the midst of some dimly lit forest. I think for a moment how the light of the world must drift into one's life like a quivering wind, like an ethereal ghost how it must call like a fire on a mountaintop calls to an army, like a king calls out to the world. The trees bend down to rustle the child Gotama's hair, it is said. Do you believe this happened, dear reader? Tell me. I believe it. I believe living magic will drift into our lives like the bodies of gods drift onto the shores of the earth. I believe the light of the world is not found in our deductions, therefore. It is not felt with the hands of our beliefs, or the fossilized figures in the wanting twilight of our winding imaginations. It arrives like a soft footprint in the grass. The meadow of our self is no meadow at all. The body of our self is a figure that emerges from the swamp and retreats from the light. There is no meadow or swamp because there are no objects, truly. And so there is no possibility for a self. The glow of a light is only had in time. Time, it means the end of all objects.
Fate. Fate is sealing our fate as we speak. Nervousness. One more about anxiousness, another about nervousness. I must say a nervous song. Not too nervous. Nervousness. My fingers, Tesla coils, see stringy sprouts spill like potato spuds. And a violet light drinks the walls and caresses the earth of my spirit. I will tame the cauldrons of the dwarf masters. Now contain the nervousness that suspends my mind before the tasks of the snap, and make it quick, quake like angry molten iron in a cast. This poem is called The Truth. The Truth. She whispers while the word games we build crawl upward into the sky of the self like an infinitely tall pillar of stacking cards. A building that pierces through the eyes of cirrus clouds like the spokes of a turning wheel. While we wrangle with our words, our hearts rise into our mouths and we feel the dispassionate gaze of the conqueror within us. The one who conquered truth and packed him away in suitcases below the concrete where, then, not a tremor was able to rise and to greet the sun, to sizzle like a raisin moistening on the tongue of man. Words bind the back of the truth the way a cask might bar fine wine from a shrinking pair of thirsty lips. Very ironically, indeed, indeed, Fortunato knew not his poor fortune. Edgar Allan Poe reference that was. Mm, the majestic chatter. There is a wine glass singing a song somewhere. I should probably pause. I mention wine a lot, but I don't drink a lot of wine. But, you know. The wine drinks you. The wine drinks me that. There we go, that's poetic. The Majestic Chatter. There is a wine glass singing a song somewhere, <laughs> responding not to pulpy lips, but to waltzing loons traveling through the air like tiny figurines. The glass is privy to a majestic chatter known to those jutting, standing rocks of seashores, battered off by waves, daily bathed by chilliness. Coral reefs, too, know the chatter. The song is bright. There, bathed by sunlight and managed by tide and color. Human legs are like this sometimes. To whirring rail lines. Human minds also sing in that spray upon the rock and in that waltzing figurine. Even now, Chinese odes bound in North America and make the dying bison once again freely sprint here upon the low lying plains. The sounds of our insides are like these many things. Today, my mind shakes. My legs wobble like two wind battered bridges. My whole being is shook up, like the grasses and the sedges of the happy buffalo trampled, low lying plain, just bounding in the majestic chatter of the winds. Mm. Mm. Well, I'll read this only because uh, we're in a pandemic and this uh, pandemic, uh, it's a sense of panic in pandemic, and this is about the apocalypse. So let's uh, tie the two thoughts together. 
This is called at the end of the world. Here, where the sun burns like the torch end of a stake, one sees the electricity flicker in layers of lights out there, leery all across the winter world. What happened here on the orb of Moses' staff? where the rocks squirm and the Nile tears near, where locust eyes beam there within the world of the human stare. The sun has not been off for long now, six minutes, yet very soon the golden soil will sizzle out like a filament or ballast, swiftly and very fast. In two minutes, all of man will learn the world is setting. Ocean light will recede from our wet and peering shores and maroon the roots, swiftly weary the dust. The light of the last living mind will freeze and breathe its final draw in the infinite lapping of the heavenly, tall and infinite darkness. Come out to us like some boogeyman behind a wall. What madness is this but a fear that we are already there? Our teary leaders singing, here, here, upon the heels of the nuclear dust and the environmental strokes, high on the midnight clocks at the tips of our hesitating morals and maleficent indecisions. There, beneath the bureaucracy of our industrial systems, then the systems meant to set us all straight, then engines again stalling before setting us all aright. What mirror is this but a near memory drifting to us by a lakeside armchair from a time long before our technological meeting, before Gabriel, before Moses, before Bakur, before White? Everyone likes to hear about the apocalypse. Okay. Ah, here's one more that I think is worth listening to. This is called imagism. So uh, imagism is worth defining. These are the three tenets of imagistic philosophy. It's a form of literary, it's a form of writing expounded by Ezra Pound. So Ezra Pound's advice, three things. The direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective, to use, to use absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. Three, as regarding rhythm, to compose in sequence of the musical phrase, not in sequence of the metra no. Images. This is a little critical of imagism, but not in any serious way. I'm quite fond of imagistic poetry. Orange signs burn around me, like orange suns. And the writer begins to ask, where is the object of this poem, truly? This, the writer, in his mousy eloquence, squeaks his salty fingertips on the keyboard like sopping soles of shoes. The squeaks speak, the speaks seek. Where can the subject go at all, really? What object is there to incarcerate? What burning sun is there to hold tall upon the table, to trap in the ministries of one's perception, subtract from the division symbols of quaking nervousness and thundering, clacking ball in socket. Flickering, leery lights and flooding gutters of this dreary, cruelest month stir like an impossible friend on the roadway of the subject. Where is that weary object at all in the midst of this, but between the bruhaha, like bugs on leaves in a forest? In that particular poem, the self is the object. So I figured that might be tricky for an imagistic style. All right. 
This is called My Baby Blue Jay. This is about a friend of mine who had a very troubling time going through the death of his mother. My Baby Blue Jay. My baby blue jay will not fly precisely the way she flew. So she is robbed, and I too am robbed, but her much more than me. My mother's wings pan the ghettos like angels' hands for crumbs of human gold. Her heart was filled with more than a billion empty cans, where creeks of New York's quiet suffering came to her to accept needed shoes. In Brooklyn, she was one of the many quiet saints who offered the bright yellow tones in the old mirror world of its drizzled streets. She offered tireless footsteps in the wanting of that lonely New York moonlight. When I dream, I dream of things I do not know that she did. And it fills me with a light as big as the world. I flip a light switch in this room the size of the galactic sun. She would frequently say to me, Jesus will save me. Meanwhile, I was preparing her medicine and sharpening my restrained tongue on a Protestant block. Her words I say to her when evening, fork no trace of lightning. And I fight with her ungently that night, where I find myself in the likeness of every dead ship that has ever felt the reef because the harpy song screeched when it was supposed to go on and song. In life, there are many songs and many, many nights for song. Here tonight, for example, my daughter floats above the earth like a peppy mist. And I can feel my mother glowing in the soles of her feet like a dry blood orange. And I must console myself with this image, because I am alone like a single droplet of rain on a mountain peak. Why am I more alone than I have ever been in all my life? What wind has carried me so far away from the milk of myself? Answer, many things have. But this consolation like these questions fade when I consider the mist and the source that scatters it out of the cracks in the earth in a bioluminescent dance. My daughter sings like my mother sings. I hum like my mother hums. My mother sleeps like a, coast, like a ghost in the corners of my earth. And I am not alone. I am not alone. I am not alone. Um, oh, that is from uh, the book, uh, the, the Rattles and Other Poems by yours truly. You can see my face, but you can't. The Rattles and Other Poems. Um, okay. Hmm. Let me read this poem. This poem is about all the labor that goes into writing poetry. Um, it's called My Eternal, it's called My Eternal Ears. My eternal ears. I have placed the labors of my soul into this poetry. Indeed, I have invested in it in the heat of many moments, when obligations in the world have called my name, asked that I come down from the hilltop to place my fingertips into the dirt. Upon nights when sleep begged to be had, but I was in love and would not, Nights when the contours of a woman's body rolled over in my mind like a giant sleeping Venus to turn my chest, hair, and shirt inside out and wanting more. And there was myself, then, memorizing the bones of her skin 
the geometries of shapes which, which, which protruded beautifully and pale from her gold cheeks, memorizing the words within her moist purple plum world and the vanilla scent of her sweetened hair. Spoutless, countless moments in which I was finally able to bend reluctant branches of eternal ears to the lost graves of charry caves that lend crutches to the limping, hollow, broken-heartedness there inside of the world of me, low stooping like a forest ground of blunted stumps. It is in the moments of such magnetism that I have always believed love was enough for poetry. Here, here. May I call it there? Sure, Mr. Henry. That was Michael Rose. We're going to set up for our next reader. Jonathan, get yourself ready.